Hi folks, welcome to Fig Tree Ministries. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking that red subscribe button below and click that bell to make sure you get notified every time we upload a new video. Enjoy today's lesson. All right, so today we're going to cover basically one word and one verse. And that one word and one verse collectively holds the full force of this power coming out of the Old Testament. It's pretty amazing. And uh, you can see on your screen there, and I put it on your sheet, the, word, the Hebrew word is pakad. We'll look at that in a minute. It's quite a dynamic word. You don't need to remember the word, but you, it'll help be helpful if you remember what the concept is and how the Bible uses it. So if you want to turn, you can turn to Luke 19, 44. We're going to be bouncing around some scriptures. If you saw the handout and printed it, it did print long. Part of the reason was I wanted you to have the scriptures in front of you. If you didn't want to be turning along, because we are going to bounce through some, I need to show you how this word kind of flows through the Old Testament. And it comes out of Luke 19, verse 44. So last week I ended with this idea that Jesus leaves Jericho, he climbs the 2,500 feet, whatever it is, 3,000 feet. He gets to the Mount of Olives, he crests the Mount of Olives, the crowds are there welcoming him, welcoming him as king. They want him to be the king. And then he sees Jerusalem in front of him, and that's a, an amazing visual. I'll show you a few pictures in a minute. But when he sees Jerusalem, he, it's not good. He begins to actually weep. And he says this, speaking of what's happening in Jerusalem, they will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. That's the enemy that's coming because you didn't obey. They will not leave one stone on another. Now, why? And this is, the, this is where everything comes funneling into this one moment. Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Now, in Hebrew, or some of your Bibles say God's visitation, that's probably more accurate. In the Hebrew, the word that's going on here is a word called pakad. And the word means a visitation. Now, it's actually got a fairly wide range of meaning. It could mean visitation. It can mean punishment. It can mean accounting when they're doing the census of the nation. That's a pakad. Last two weeks, we looked at a, we looked at a parable where a king is going to demand an accounting. Well, that's a pakad. A king arrives back. It's his visitation, and he's going to take an accounting, and it's going to be either positive or negative. So this is going to be our this is going to be our main focus, and there's so much that goes into this concept. It's really, it's amazing. So, God willing, I'll be able to at least show you a little bit of that. It's really a powerful concept. All right, that's where we're going. We always have to remember, in the beginning of the book of Luke, Luke says, I've put this into an orderly account. Now, when he says, I put it into an orderly account, you should trust him on that and pay attention to the order of his account. Luke, his, his flow is often different than Matthew or Mark, and he does that for theological reasons. He's got, God gives him editorial control. He does it for theological reasons. And so when Luke says, I, I'm giving you a flow of events, pay, att pay attention to the flow of events. So for instance, one thing that's a little bit different about Luke, Luke presents Jesus as a prophet. Now, prophet, not somebody to foretell the future. Prophet, somebody who speaks truth to power. That's what the prophets of the Old Testament do. They show up and they say to the king or whoever's in charge, woe to you because you're not acting justly or woe to you because you're not following the covenant. That's a prophet, speaks truth to power. So Jesus is shown as someone who's going to speak truth to power. That's what we've been looking at for the past six weeks. So the, if we do a little flow of events, as time is going on, 
we've gone through over this past six weeks, we started with the rich man and Lazarus. That's a parable, and the parable is directed towards the priests, those in power. So that's speaking truth to power. Then we move to the Pharisee and the tax collector. Well, the Pharisees were the religious leaders. Don't inappropriately judge somebody, or don't look down on others in your own self-righteous, self-righteousness. Then you have, and we didn't do this story, but packed in the middle there is the rich young ruler, and there's a whole bunch packed into that. And at that rich young ruler, it's the point where the, the disciples, or Jesus says, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, and the, the disciples say, well, then who can be saved? Shortly after that, you get another rich person. That's Zacchaeus, same Greek word. And so you got to put those, you have to connect those and say, what are, what's, the rich young ruler was obeying the commandments. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, yet Zacchaeus was the one who was saved. So somebody who is rich can be saved. Then we get to the parable of the minas. This is what we've done the past two weeks. A king, or someone goes off to be made king. The subjects don't want him to be king. That would be the priests. If Jesus is the Messiah, they have to listen to him. They don't want to do that. So he's, and that parable of the minas about a king who goes away and then comes back to take an accounting fits in Luke's telling exactly what's going to happen next as Jesus arrives at Jerusalem. So this whole thing is, it's a flow where so much of it is pointed at those in charge, the priests with the rich man and Lazarus, the Pharisees with the tax collector. It's a rich young ruler, somebody who's in charge, but not using their money appropriately. Then you have someone who's, who's been pushed aside and marginalized, and Jesus says, no, salvation comes to this house, Zacchaeus. And then you have the parable about the king who went away to return and bring an accounting. So it's important that we follow at least recognize that there's a culmination happening here at verse 44, and it's a huge culmination. Okay, one thing to point out, and this is uh, number three on your sheet, scholars have noted that within Luke, there's a definite theme going on that they call the travel narrative, Luke's travel narrative. Now, if you if you Google Luke's travel narrative, you'll find exactly what I'm talking about. Because don't turn there in your Bible. I'm just going to go over this real quick. At Luke 9.51 is where it starts. Because it says, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. It's like everything in the, in the story of Luke turns on this sentence. And Jesus is now pointed right towards Jerusalem. And he's moving in that direction for a purpose. It ends at the verse we're talking about, Luke 19, 44. This is his arrival in Jerusalem because Luke 19, 45, the very next thing is he's at the temple. He's overturning the temple. So this is what we would call a, tra a travel narrative. And again, it's a, it's a climactic storytelling so that when you get to this the pinnacle of it, there's a significance to it of when Jesus arrives, what he says, how his arrival is, he's acting all of this stuff out, and the crowd is going nuts. So that's called the travel narrative, and the travel narrative ends, if you happen to look down in your Bible and just before verse 44, is what we call the triumphal entry. Now, that's our term for it. But what is, what's happening here? Well, just like the parable of the minas, where a king was away for a time and now is coming back to take an accounting, God is showing up to Jerusalem as the king. People were longing for God to come back as king, overthrow the Romans, give us our nation back. In Jesus' arrival, he's saying, God's now returning as the king. N.T. Wright has a book called How God Became King. This is, this is what the, we're presenting here. And of course, Jesus is the agent of God that brings about that kingdom. He's the Messiah. So Messiah is the anointed one, which is shorthand for king. The Christ is Greek. So Jesus, the Christ, 
That's anointed one. That means he's the king. And Jesus is the king of kings. He's Lord of lords. So he's showing up as the king. Now, of course, how things unfold is not what they wanted. They want a king to go to war and overthrow the Romans. And Jesus says, that's not the path to peace. The path to peace is is forgiveness, and I'm going to suffer and die, and then resurrect, and then I'll be king. Oh, we didn't quite catch on to that. So that, you know, the disciples are constantly asking Jesus, when's the kingdom coming, Jesus? Come on. So Jesus shows up as the agent who brings God's reign. He's, it's representative of God returning. Okay, so that's the story we're in. Jesus ascends. This is a picture of the Mount of Olives. He comes over the hill right at about this saddle right here. There's still a road today. The road comes down the hill through these trees. So Jesus would have crested the hill. And as the crowds are going nuts, as he's crested the hill, what he sees in front of him is this. It's Jerusalem. And what would, well, today there's a mosque there. But what would have sat there at that day is the temple. And if you remember last year, we did the, we talked about the triumphal entry. Jesus is coming in to judge the temple. Now, not judgment as let's destroy it into nothing. Judgment so that we can renew this temple into something bigger. The temple goes away, but what replaces it is the worldwide church. We're now... The Holy Spirit goes out and lands on the disciples. They become the the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a judgment. It's a judgment, but it's a transition for the better. Okay, so that's what Jesus sees. But here he is. He comes up. He sees this. He crests the hill. He's looking over Jerusalem. And that's when he begins to speak and weep, actually. Jerusalem, if only you had known what was going to bring you peace. And then he goes into his prophecy about what's going to happen to you. We'll sh- I'll talk about it that, that at the end. And then finally he says, If only you had known the time of, and there's a Greek word there, but in Hebrew it would have been pakad, God's visitation. That's what's happening. God's returning and visiting his people just like he said he would throughout the whole Old Testament. But what does that mean, God's visitation? So let's go now. We're on now verse 4, or I'm sorry, verse 4, number 4 on your handout. I've already mentioned the word pakad. It often gets translated visitation. It can mean punishment. It can mean accounting. It has a It has a broad semantic range. There's a large number of meanings for this word depending on the context that you put the word in. The Hebrew words are so amazing because one word has so many diverse meanings, and sometimes the meanings, they're all connected in a way, right? A punishment is a type of accounting. When God visits you and he takes an account, well, if it's not good, you're not going to be happy about it. So. What we're going to see, and this is so cool how the prophets play this out, because they play with this word. It can mean to punish. That's one way that pakad can mean. So a visitation as a punishment. There's also a visitation to care for. Now, those are totally the opposite. When God shows up, what's going to happen? Right? When, he, when God shows up in this, his visitation, what's going to happen? Is it a punishment or is it a care for? Well, that depends. That depends on what you've been doing with your life. It's so cool. Watch how the, the prophets play this out. I want to show you a picture. We've looked at this picture before. The concept of Picard, this, this visitation, they, in their minds, this visitation became this ominous thing that was going to happen at some point in the future. God's going to visit you. What is going on in this verse is you get all of that Old Testament meaning is coming into almost like a one moment in time with Jesus. 
And of course, that's a lot of what's happening with the Old Testament is it's all going, it's all being funneled into Jesus. So I've showed you this picture before. Now, many of you on the call have not seen this. I put the website you can find this at. It's a guy named Chris Harrison, and he's a professor at Carnegie Mellon University in, in Pennsylvania. And what you're looking at is a visualization of the Bible. So that represents the Bible. You have this is going from the beginning of the Bible to the end. So across the bottom, you start at Genesis, you end at Revelation. And across the bottom, you see those little gray lines that are dropping down. Each one of those lines is a chapter in the Bible. So if, for instance, if you know which the longest chapter in the Bible shows up right here, and I know many of you know the longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119. So the reason you have that big extension is because of all the verses in Psalm 119. So what they did was they listed all the chapters, and then each one of those colorful arcs is where you connect one some chapter later in the Bible connects back to the beginning. It's a remarkable picture. And then, of course, what they do is the, the different colors, darker blue to purple means there's a close connection. Yellow to gr green to yellow is the connection is farther. So if it's a connecting New Testament back to Genesis, you get a yellow arc. Anyways, it's one of the coolest pictures of the Bible itself, right? And what's going to happen is you have all of these usages of the word pakad, and they're all going to flow in some type of arc. They're flowing in to all culminate at this one point in time with Jesus going through um, and this verse uh, 44. Go, if you have some time, go to that website and check out that. It's something over 63,000 connections where the Bible makes reference to itself. And there's probably more than 63,000, but that's what they came up with. And it's just a cool image of what the Bible would look like visually if you're seeing all these connections. But it's important when we talk about Pakad to realize how connected and what's happening with this word. So, it's a visitation. Now, the God's visitation, so let's, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through some Old Testament verses to show you how this gets used in the text, depending on the context. So if we start at Psalm 8, this is, of course, Psalm 8. You can turn there if you want. If not, I put it on your sheet. So Psalm 8 is this amazing psalm about what it means to be a human being in God's creation. And then the psalmist goes down this path and he says, he's looking up at the night sky. And he says, God, I can't believe that you would pay attention to a human being, right? So when we go out, when you go out on a really dark night, or you go out to the mountains or out to the desert, and you look up at the night sky, a sense of awe happens. That's the, that's the sense you get. You're laying there. It's so vast. And the awe is a combination of two things. There's a recognition of how small you are. So there's a sense of fear because I'm so small. At the same time, you're observing something that's so transcendent. We still don't know the mysteries of what's out there today. It's so transcendent. So the psalmist is looking up at the night sky, and then he's realizing, I'm so small, yet God, you pay attention to me. And that's what the night sky can do to you. Gives you that sensation of awe and how big the God's universe is. So if we look at Psalm 8, start, or verse 3 goes like this. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. So that's what the psalmist is doing, looking up at the stars. And he gets that overwhelming sense of awe, which makes him feel small. And then he says this, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you would care for them. Now notice that care for them. God, I'm so small, and yet you care for me. Now, that word care right there is pakad. 
what is mankind that you would visit us? So I think that if you have the King James or the New King James, I think it says visit. God visits all of us. We, we can't we don't even understand how that happens, but he does it. And he cares for us. That's at least in the positive sense, right? So this is one of the great sentences, verses in the Bible that has Picard in it. But it's all about God wants to visit the human being. What an amazing God that is in the world that we live in. It's not just forces in the world that are random and trying to crush you. It's a God who cares for you. I want to give you something to help you think about this concept. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a statement on the screen. I'm not going to read it right away because I don't want to have any, in, when I read it, I don't want to have any inflections in my voice. You almost, I want you to read it with whatever voice is in your mind. So imagine this, imagine if you're a young child, well, let's say 10, 11, maybe 12 years old. So you're a preteen. Something happens at school. So imagine back when you were in grade school or middle school, something happens to you at school. You go home and you go to tell your mother about what happened. And then uh, now, I'll show you this statement, and what I want you to watch is when you read this statement, watch what goes on, listen to the own voice in your head, okay? So here's the statement. So imagine you come home, something happened at school, and your mother says these words, wait till your father gets home. Now, how do, you, how do you hear that in your mind? Is it positive? Wow, you got, an a, you got an A on your report card. Wait till your father gets home. This is so exciting. Is that how you hear it in your mind? Or is it negative? What happened at school? You did what? Wait till your father gets home. So the same sentence can be read positively or negatively, negatively, and if you have a guilty conscience, you're probably reading it negative. Because people with a guilty conscience always hear things as if they're guilty. But this is Picard. When, God, when Father comes home to visit you, is it going to be positive or is it going to be negative? Well, it depends. What did you do at school? So that's the whole point of Picard. God's going to pay a visit to his people. Positive? We hope so. Negative? It might be. Depends on what you did. Okay, so hopefully that'll at least give you an idea of, it's a very dynamic word, and when I show you a couple of the, the prophets and how they use it in the same sentence, it's really cool what he does. Okay, now here's what I want you to do. If, well, if you want, in your Bible, go to Exodus 32, because I want to show you a couple places that this word shows up. Then we'll go to the prophets, and then we'll end up back in Luke to show you the progression of this idea of God's visitation. So if we start in Exodus 32, 34, the context of this verse is the golden calf. So they had said to God, yes, God, we're excited. They actually had a sense of awe because God was on the mountain. Then God says, do you want to be in covenant together? They said, yes, we'll do everything you say. We will obey you. And then a few short chapters later, they're building the golden calf, and you get God's now punishment is going to happen. Now go lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, now that's the NIV. So They've taken the word pakad and they've put it into punish. Now, some of yours, it might say, when the time comes for me to visit my people, or when it comes time for me to visit my punishment, is probably more accurate. So, however, when it comes time for me to visit my, the punishment, and then next part of the sentence, I will punish pakad them for their sins. So, you see the word used twice or I will visit their punishment, 
on them for their sins, something like that. So God says, look, I see that you've sinned. Now I'm going to show up and visit the punishment upon them. You, it's got a much deeper reading than simply I'm going to punish. Okay, so that's one. Now I'll go to the next one. If you're in your Bible, turn two chapters over, maybe a page or two, to Exodus 34.7. Now Exodus 34.7, we looked at last week with the great attributes of God. I am gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and forgiving of all kinds of sins. And then God says this, Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, and now comes the pakad. He punishes, pakad, the children and their children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. In that context, if you're talking about unpunished, then... Picard goes into punishment. Now, some really cool ones, because this is where it really gets dynamic. So turn in your Bible to Jeremiah 23. It's going to be verse 1 and 2. So Jeremiah 23, 1 to 2. Now, over the past few weeks, as we've talked about Jesus's, so much of his ire is directed at the priests or the religious leaders, if you want to put them all collectively. So watch how Jeremiah 23, 1 and 2 begins. Woe to the shepherds. Now, where have we heard that before? Well, a couple weeks ago when in Zacchaeus. It's a woe to the shepherds. Ezekiel is saying the same thing. Woe to you shepherds who are leading my flock. So woe to you shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. That's exactly what Ezekiel says, and it's exactly what Jesus brings into the Zacchaeus story. So woe to you shepherds who are destroying and scattering the fleet of my, the fleet, excuse me, the sheep of my pasture. Then he says this. I'm skipping down just a touch. He says, because you scattered my flock and have driven them away, and not bestowed care, that's pakad, cared for. So here, Jeremiah first uses pakad in the positive sense, because you did not care for them, bestow care, pakad. And then he goes right into the next pakad. I will bestow punishment, pakad, on you for the evil that you have done. So this sentence is we don't you, you, see you can't see the wordplay going on in English because it's care and punishment, but in Hebrew same word, and that would resonate as the as it's being spoken in Hebrew. You would hear that the the same word being used because you didn't bestow care, pakad. I'm going to bestow punishment, pakad, and it's so cool how that same word carries those two separate meanings, and it's not just. I will bestow care or punishment. It's when I arrive for my visitation, I will bestow care and punishment. So you can see how that same word carries those two opposite meanings here and how the prophet is playing with that. Okay, last prophet before we get to Luke, and this is the one that I think is exactly where Jesus is. He's right in the Zechariah issue. So turn. Last turn in your Old Testament, turn to Zechariah 10, and it's verse 3. Now, he's going to do both. He's going to do exactly the same thing that Jeremiah just did. He's going to do negative and a positive. And as I mentioned, this is probably right where Jesus is at, and I'll show you why in a minute, because there's a lot of Zechariah going on with the Messiah. Zechariah is a, is a messianic-type prophet. He's looking to the future when God's kingdom will be established here on earth. Okay, so here's what Zechariah... Now again, if Jesus is in Zechariah, think Zacchaeus, right? My anger burns against the shepherds. So once again, Zacchaeus is pointing to those religious leaders who are muddying the waters and trampling the grass and not taking care of the flock. So my anger burns against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders. Pakad. Very next part of the verse. For the Lord Almighty will care for, Pakad, 
his flock, the people of Judah. So when Jesus says, you did not recognize the time of God's visitation, which is the word Picard, the crowd hears all of the different ways that Picard is being used. And if they're, if they're recognizing the triumphal entry is a fulfillment of Zechariah 9. So the first, the chapter just before this, Zech, if, you, if you have your Bible open and you look at Zechariah 9, 9, you all know that one. Your king comes to you, Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, the colt of a foal. That's exactly what Jesus just did at the triumphal entry. He's fulfilling Zechariah 9, and then he gets to the end of this little piece as he's entering, and he, he quotes God's visitation, which shows up in Zechariah 10.3. So it's, it's likely that's where Jesus is. He's really inside of Zechariah right now, because Zechariah is talking about the coming king. Are you going to be prepared for his visitation? All right, so that's how the prophets use it. It's so cool and such a dynamic word. We could spend a whole class on all the different ways it's used. So let me switch gears. Now, if God is going to visit, the question I have for us to think about, because how can we apply this to our lives or the world that we live in today? And it has to do with God's timeline. When is he going to visit, right? So they always knew that there's an ominous time where God is going to visit you and judge what you've been doing. So that idea, of course, is all over the, time, all over the Old Testament. But what's his timeline? And I can tell you this, God's timeline is probably different than ours. Because when we have our own timelines, they're usually self-serving, right? I want it done right now because I'm uncomfortable, God, so please fix this for me, right? There's a, there's a selfishness and self-servingness to when God is going to act. And part of us living in peace is to release the responsibility for time to God. God, you be in charge of the time it takes for all of this to unfold. I can't figure that out. So if we look at God's timeline, because we're talking about judgment, and judgment is God's justice showing up. So if you say, well, here's the kind of the, we're moving forward in the world over this period of time, and most of us, when we think about God's arrival or God's justice, we tend to only think in terms of the final judgment, that yes, one day there will be an accounting from everybody. The whole earth will have to give an account. And God is going to right all the wrongs. That's resurrection. It's an issue of justice. He's going to right all the wrongs. But what I think that does, when we only think final judgment, we forget that God is acting today. So what about tomorrow? What about the next day? When does God visit you? Well, he visits you all the time. So in one sense, in one sense, you could say, well, there's a, going to be a final judgment. Sure, I get that. But there's also judgment happening all the time. And you know it in your life when you realize either you should have done something, you failed to do it, a sin of omission, and then it fell apart, right? Or you, it's a sin of commission. You did something and then got caught. And all of us know that if you start engaging in something like, you know, a nefarious scheme, you, you know that judgment's coming. And it's a horrible thing to live with. God's judgment is constantly being played out. We just can't see it. Is it going to happen just in the final judgment? I say no way. I say the answer to when is God's visitation is yes, all the way across the board. So much of our, our vision of God's justice is our human vision. We think of it in our own terms, right? But I say, no way. I, God works in very strange ways, and justice happens in very strange ways. So how do you walk through the world? Well, walk in a way that when God arrives, he's going to bless you instead of receiving a punishment. So I want to at least show you. I know many of you are probably familiar with this term. It's an expression about justice. I just want to show you. Because this is how, what's God's timeline? Well, his timeline is different than ours. So there's an old saying, this isn't from the Bible, but 
The wheels of justice turn slowly, but grind exceedingly fine. And so it's a very old, it's an ancient saying, but they recognize that justice doesn't always happen at the time we want, in the way that we want. But it does happen. And when the wheels of justice turn slowly, they will grind. Everybody gets caught up in the wheels of justice. So God's justice, in some regard, is always in effect. It's always working. Either we can't see it in progress, or we have a different conception of how it's going to work. But the reality is, nobody gets away with anything. So one of the, you know, we look out in the world today, and you see injustices all over the place. People lying and cheating and stealing and manipulating and all of that. Pray for God's Picard to show up. Pray for God to show up with justice. It's like Habakkuk. Habakkuk has a complaint. God, there's so much justice in the world. Where are you? Why aren't you, you know? And God says, hey, wait a minute, Habakkuk. Wait a minute. You don't know what I'm working behind the scenes. So hold your horses there. My justice is working. Anyways, I would argue God's justice is always at play. Let me show you from the Bible. It doesn't mean final judgment, but watch God's justice through the Bible. Here's a whole bunch of things that happened when God's, when God's justice shows up. The flood is one, right? The people are carousing. God says, oh, none of that anymore. Let's, we'll have the flood. You have Cain's punishment. Cain kills his brother. And we think, well, then God's going to have Cain killed, but he doesn't. He says, no, 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 Cain, you're going to have to live with what you did. And Cain says, it's too much for me to bear. I can't bear it because your conscience is going to crush you. That's going to be the justice. Tower of Babel is a justice. Pharaoh is a justice. God's justice coming against Pharaoh. Uh, we just read about the golden calf. There's justice. The exile in Babylon that happened in 586 BC. That's justice for letting go of the covenant. And then, as we're going to see, Jesus arrives, but the justice isn't immediate. It takes 40 years. Yeah, a little less than 40 years before that temple's destroyed, which is how we interpret that as the judgment for the wrongs that you committed, the killing of a righteous person. But it took 40 years. So God's justice is always working. And we have to release the timing of that to him so that we can sit in peace and not be wondering how long it's going to take for justice to arrive. Okay, with all of that, with that whole concept of God's visitation and God's justice, let's go back and just read one more time Luke 19, 41 to 44. I'll take it back a little bit because I want to show you how Jesus approaches Jerusalem. He comes over the Mount of Olives. He's looking down upon the city as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city. Jesus wept. It's it's one of the, I think it's only the two times he wept at uh, Lazarus. He cried at when Lazarus died, and he weeps here. And the weep is, if you, Jerusalem, even you, you should have known better, Jerusalem. This is God's house. How did you miss this? If only even you had known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. Sorry about that. And then he says this, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. That's a violation of the covenant. It comes from Deuteronomy. If you want to write it down, it's Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 52. God says, when you go against my covenant, I will lay siege to your cities. And that's not a fun experience. That's the judgment. So that was Deuteronomy 28, 52, if you want to look that verse up. The enemies, because you're not repenting, the enemies are going to come. They're going to circle your city. They'll dash you to the ground, your children within their walls. They will not leave one stone on another. Why? Because you did not recognize the time of God's visitation. Now, who's the visitation bad for? Well, it's bad for, it's a punishment, 
if you are disobeying God, it's a blessing. Now, we would say for Jesus, the blessing is those, the followers of Jesus. They recognized God's arrival and they honored that arrival. Okay. Last verse, because I want to take this forward a little bit and see what Peter says to us about the same idea. It's about living out our lives. Peter says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your deeds and glorify God. And then here's the word on the day he visits us. Peter knows the concept the day of God's visitation. And what Peter's saying is, when the day of God's visitation, if you have honored God, then even the Gentiles, the pagans, will, uh, will see your deeds as what, for what they are. So, here's the question. How's this phrase going to be in your, how's this phrase going to work out for us, right? Or how's this phrase going to work out to the, for the world? Wait till your father gets home. Is it going to be the positive blessing that you receive? Well done, good and faithful servant. Or is it the punishment you're cast out because you didn't honor what I wanted you to do. Everybody's going to have to give this account. And that's the judgment that's, that's coming or unfolding, as I would argue, all the time. All right, so that is Picard. That's God's visitation. Hopefully, I was able to take you a little bit wider circle on that just to give you a a little larger foundation that there's such a massive concept behind that of, of God visiting his people. And it's such a cool dynamic word in a uh, Hebrew word. Great example of some of the dynamic Hebrew words and how they have opposite meanings, but the opposite meanings are in connection with one another. Okay, so that's Pekad, God's visitation. Let me stop the share. You know, just like the example I gave, the Father loves you, and so if he's going to punish you, it's oftentimes because he, he wants you to grow. When we, when we, even as Christians, misstep, we do something wrong, or maybe even it's a sin of omission, you know, we ignore something and then it falls apart on us. God wants us to, you know, he wants us to grow through that judgment, even though the judgment hurts. That's exactly right. When they get some, a bad report card and they you say, wait till your father gets home. Then, you know, the child is like suffering under the anxiety of what's dad going to do. But dad doesn't want to punish him because he hates him. He wants to punish him so that they'll transform into something more, more capable in the world. Now, I know I probably could not capture the full concept of Picard. It's really a deep, it's really a deep idea that comes out of that Old Testament. And I I think it culminates right there in one way, in one sense. It'll culminate again at the final judgment. There's a lot more going on in that little, little Greek sentence from Jesus than we can even fathom. That was the whole point of trying to present it. <laughs>